Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. We got a 6L80E core all torn down on the bench, cleaned up and ready to put back together. Uh, I had originally uh, disassembled this thing to harvest some hard parts out of it uh, in preparation for a uh, 6L80E build that unfortunately doesn't look like it's going to be happening. So figured while I have everything cleaned up and you know all nice and organized on the bench, I film the whole process so at least I have some content out there on the channel for those curious about um, what it would take to assemble uh, and rebuild a 6L80 or 6L90 e transmission. So we're going to be doing some things uh, on this reassembly that we would never ever do on an actual rebuild including reusing soft parts, things like lip seals, sealing rings, o-rings, things of that nature. Um, you know, Also we're going to be reinstalling the same um, clutches that came out of the transmission, you'd never redo that. Or you'd never you know do that um, at the same time we're going to be installing well pretty much everything else that came out of it as well so uh, bonded pistons the um, low sprag snap ring and uh, you know parking rod assembly one two three four piston all those things you would replace during an actual overhaul so I'll spend this overview kind of talking through some of the specific procedures and um, updating that you would want to do for any 6L80E rebuild, um, touch on considerations for performance, and, and then we'll get into the actual reassembly so that you can see you know, what the level of effort is, scope of the work, and some of the specialized tooling you'll need. And I'll also show you a couple of tips and tricks and workarounds um, in the event you don't have or don't have access to certain specialized tools so that you can still get the job done. So. Anyway, um, we got starting over here, the valve body or command and control complex as I like to call it, including the Tecum IMS and you know speed sensor harness, all that good stuff. Have a separate video on the disassembly and reassembly of that, as well as the pump and the pump section will come immediately following this overview. So starting with the case, one of the things you always wanna do when rebuilding one of these things is replace the parking rod. Uh, those uh, mechanisms are known for failure. It's a, a documented issue with these 6L80s and 90s. The parking rod bullet, if you will, the uh, very end of the rod that actually engages the parking pole, likes to break, uh, you know, wears out, and then eventually fails. And of course, when it does, you don't have the ability to put the vehicle in park. You know, that's an obvious problem. So you want to make sure you do that on every overhaul. Uh, you'll need a special tool to remove the roll pins. Uh, we'll show you how to do that once we go back together with the case. And um, as far as I know, you, know, you might be able to uh, work around the need for that special tool by using some very long diagonal, um, you know, diagonal cutters and you know prying up on the roll pins. But um, it's not advisable, and the special tool is not that you know not that expensive, and you can readily find it on eBay. All right, as far as um, bolts and small parts, uh, nothing that you need to replace. I mean, there's nothing like a torque to yield fasteners or anything like that. Um, for the starfish sockets, you're gonna need a special snap-on socket. Um, I'll flash uh, an image up close, but I believe the uh, part number is uh, EPL10, and that will allow you to remove the uh, valve body assembly from the case and you know reattach it. So as far as the pump assembly goes, um, for any 6L80 and 6L90, you want to completely rework the pump. That means resurface the pump cover and you know refacing it so it's completely flush and true. And then for the pump body slash bell housing, uh, you'll want to reface the working surface there, as well as cut the uh, rotor and slide pocket such that the clearance between the rotor and the slide, as uh, you know, their top of their working surfaces with the face of the pump body is one to one and a half thousandths of an inch. Um, you know, that's the tolerance you want to hold. Uh, that has to be done on every one of these rebuilds. Uh, the, these pumps almost always require it. I I think I've seen maybe one or two of these that came in pretty much immaculate, pristine, where working surfaces did not have to be touched up and the rotor and slide were still within the factory specified clearance. It's very, very rare, so I would count on having that you know, as being just a standard part of the rebuild procedure, you know, no different than replacing, you know, clutches and, you know, soft parts and whatnot. Um, 
The other thing that you will want to do is install uh, either a Transgo valve body kit or a Sonics zip kit. I recommend the Sonics zip kit. It's a little more expensive. I think I'm going to say it's twice as much as the Transgo valve body kit, but it has parts for the pump, parts for the uh, you know upper and lower valve bodies, and you know it'll correct a lot of the drivability symptoms that are sourced within the hydraulics and, and the valving of these things. So strongly recommend you install at least something uh, you don't really want to put it back together purely factory uh, as, as you may have reoccurrence of some of the issues that maybe led to it being on the bench in the first place. Hey, 3.5 in reverse drum, um, you're always going to want to reinforce the welds here at the base of the drum. These are notorious for cracking and leaking and of course the result is a completely torched 3.5 in reverse clutch. So it usually shows up as slippage in reverse and, you know, eventually slippage in third and fifth gear. And, you know, once it gets to the point to, to where the weld has completely failed and you're hemorrhaging apply fluid into the case that should be going to apply that piston, you lose the ability to, you know, put the vehicle in reverse altogether. Um, do not purchase a new drum unless the splines or, you know, the uh, ceiling um, surface for the uh, pump stator ceiling rings you know, either one of those places are excessively worn. You just simply need to reinforce the welds, um, you know, in the back of the drum where I showed you. Uh, as far as apply pistons and balance pistons, you always want to replace all of your molded steel and rubber pistons with new ones. Just use the OEM stuff. They're all made by National. And the 1, 2, 3, 4 piston for all years, 6L80 and 90, should always be replaced with the Sonics Billet aluminum counterpart. These are notorious for cracking and failing, and you lose the ability to move forward. And I want to say the earlier, um, you know, first gen 2006 to 2010 are more um, problematic than, you know, later iterations. But, uh, I mean, we see problems with these that doesn't really matter, you know, what the year is or when, uh, you know, when the transmission came off the assembly line. They should always be replaced on any overhaul. It's up to you if you want to replace all of the... Uh, Belleville plate style return springs. Uh, I typically do just simply because they're to me a wear item and then it's standard practice for me to replace them in you know any transmission that has them and they're real popular for you know the foreign units like the ZF series which this transmission design is based on the ZF6 HP26 in particular as well as some of the older legacy three speeds like the C6 and you know the 727 torque flight and any of the four speeds that uh, descended from them to where Belleville plates are present in the transmission. Okay, as far as friction module, I would strongly recommend you install either a Borg Warner or Raybestos high energy friction uh, module throughout the transmission. Um, you know, either one of those uh, clutches will be um, more than sufficient for 99% of, you know, needs and applications and usage patterns for these transmissions. Now you can install some high performance stuff if you're going to be racing, street strip, or you know, doing any kind of really, really serious um, heavy duty towing, hauling, and working. But um, the Borg Warners or the Raybestos clutches, like I said, should be fine for most needs. Okay, for bushings, like any other transmission, replace all your bushings throughout the transmission. Never reuse your old bushings. Bushings act to keep all of the rotating assembly, gear train, etc through the uh, center line of the bore, you know, in terms of the case. So you want to make sure that that axis stays, you know, true from end to end. So replace your bushings and the transmission will be, you know, very happy. Uh, you also want to replace your roller bearings. So there's two of them in this transmission. There's one here on the rear planet and then there's one on the back of the 3.5 in reverse drum. Uh, the 3.5 in reverse drum in particular, uh, there's a lip seal, uh, you know, that's integral to that bearing, so you definitely want to replace that on overhaul. As far as the um, center support and your rear gear train, you want to replace this snap ring. This is what holds the um, low reverse clutch slash uh, rear sprag assembly, you know, sprag clutch in place. Uh, this can break. It's not super common, but at the same token, you want to make sure you replace it with a new one. We're not going to do that, but you always want to do that. Bearings themselves, just check them. Okay, if they feel like there's a bunch of sand or grit in there, 
they're making noise, then you want to replace them. And if you see that on one or two, I'd just replace all of them. Um, if they're all good, then you can put them back in. Uh, bearings are not known to be a super high, uh, you know, pattern failure, or, you know, cause for concern in these transmissions. Um, but like anything else, you want to use good judgment. Um, your one-way sprag clutch itself, always, always, always replace your one-way clutch elements inside any transmission. This one is no different. Okay, as far as the rear gear train itself, just check your planet. Make sure that the uh, Ravino style planetary carrier is in good shape. Uh, once you remove this bearing here, then you'll be able to gain access to the sun gears and the bearings inside. Just check them, make sure they're in good shape. Uh, otherwise, just soak this thing in fresh transmission fluid. You want to use deck six, you know, full synthetic. Uh, whatever you do, do not use solvents like brake cleaner or carb cleaner or whatever to try and clean them out. And, you know, I see some guys using like compressed air to blow out all of the solvent. You really don't want to do that because that, that puts a lot of wear and tear on the needle bearings and these pinions. And, uh, you know, that can actually cause them to fail. So. Uh, just soak it in fresh transmission fluid, otherwise wipe it down after you inspect it and it'll be fine. And for the output shaft, again, bushing, other than that, just check it over, make sure that the drum's not cracked or anything unusual is observed. If so, just replace it. Okay, so that's the 6L80E. Um, whenever you go back together with one of these things before it can be driven, you will need to perform what's called a fast adapt relearn. Uh, that's a procedure that enables the transmission's, um, you know, command and control logic for the, uh, you know, controlling the unit to reset to factory specs. A lot of times when these things start to go, the TECM will, or the ECM and the TECM, I should say, will, you know, modify and adapt the transmission to those conditions. So increases in line pressure, changes, slightly changing the uh, scheduling of shifts and you know other command and control updates and you know adaptations as you know whatever the problem is is progressing it's you know trying to save the transmission from more serious damage so you want to make sure that you do the fast adapt relearn you don't want to have the vehicle adapt on its own that takes forever and if the line pressure is too high you can actually break things um, and same with the pump if you have excessive line pressure issues in the pump you put the 2.6 clutch um, at risk you know, the center support specifically and blowing out the uh, lugs where the snap ring is. Um, every once in a while, you know, we'll see a snap ring um, groove that's been blown out because of excessive line pressure, runaway line pressure due to a uh, um, pressure regulator valve or boost valve failure. All right, if there's anything I missed, uh, I'll annotate it as, you know, we're progressing through this overview, but uh, that should give you a, a really good substantive idea as to how to approach uh, a 6L80 or 6L90 rebuild. Um, there's other upgraded parts, like for example, the 456 clutch that sees some heat. You can install, uh, you know, choline steels as well as a choline um, coated heavy duty pressure plate there in lieu of the stock piece. Um, I mean, you know, there's really no limit to the amount of money you can pour into these things, but as far as for 99.9% .9 of applications, uh, what I covered should meet those needs and ensure the transmission lasts a good long while. All right, now with all that over, let's go ahead and get to work. Okay, we're gonna put the pump together for the 6L80E. It's a 08 unit, first generation. So uh, this particular, uh, you know, whole video series on the 6L80 is just purely for, you know, video slash educational purposes. Uh, you know, I mentioned this in the valve body video too, but I'll mention it here. Uh, there is no customer for this transmission. So, um, you know, we're gonna be doing things that you would never ever do during a rebuild. Uh, but the purpose is just to show you like, you know, what uh, the process looks like, what's involved and what it will take uh, to fully, you know, reassemble one of these transmissions, uh, you know, from start to finish. So, you know, this is part of that process. So we're going to be reusing consumables that you would, you know, throw out like uh, the support O-ring for the slide, uh, the slide spring and buffer spring or pivot pin spring, these two things. Uh, we're reusing the veins, the ceiling rings, uh, the pump O-ring, um, bushings, 
uh, and we're not putting in any kind of um, you know hydraulic improvement kit such that uh, the likes you would get from Sonics or Transgo, which is normally what we would do. You know, this is literally a 100% factory rebuild using the uh, parts that came out of it. And this core is in good shape, so it you know, kind of lends itself to that, I guess. But All right, so we'll go over the valve trains real quick. This is our boost and pressure regulator valve assembly. Uh, there's improved boost and PR valves available you know, from Sonics and other uh, you know, aftermarket manufacturers. Uh, then we have our uh, clutch control valve, torque converter clutch control valve, our pressure relief bowl and spring, and then our um, and then our converter feed limit valve. We'll start on the TCC side of the pump cover first, and then I'm actually going to do that pressure relief bowl last. I'm going to chuck this uh, pump cover up into a vise, you know, soft jawed vise, so that. Uh, I have a little bit more leverage of getting it uh, getting it in there. All right, uh, there's some crew working. So if you hear that, you know, noise in the background and it sounds like uh, Mexican music or whatever, um, that's that's what that is. All right, so I know I said I'd start on the other side, but I'm just going to get the boost valve and whatnot out of the way first. So PR valve. Okay, a lot of drivability symptoms and um, failures associated with the stock PR valve wearing out, uh, wearing out the bore, and you know erratic line pressures and such. So, on overhaul, it's recommended that you install an improved pressure regulator valve from either Sonics or Transgo or somebody. Put a little uh, green assembly lube here to prevent that little boost valve from coming out. Okay, so when you install the um, the retainer pin, you know, a roll pin, um, you want to make sure you get it um, so that it's fully engaged, you know, on this side. Okay, and this on the side of the of the sleeve. Just all the way down, as far as you can push it, just like this. And then just relax tension. And this is what it'll look like when it's installed correctly. Okay, if you don't install correctly, it's not all the way in as far as it should go, then a lot of times you'll have very low line pressure at idle and no line rise whatsoever, and you'll you'll smoke the transmission, you know, within a mile or so of driving it. Okay, next we're going to do the uh, converter clutch regulator valve. That's going to go over in here. The valve in first, then your spring, and then I'm going to flip it right side up so that we can seat the little retainer. So the long axis or edge of the retainer faces toward the working surface here on the pump cover. So you have to collapse the spring a fair amount into the bore so that you can get it completely behind this little retainer. And if you're like me and you like to wear gloves, just know that there's a good possibility that you might, you know, catch the glove in there. Okay, we're going to save this for last. That's the uh, pressure relief bowl and spring. So is your converter limit valve, the valve goes inboard, and then the spring. So same deal. In fact, I may end up having to do this on, on the other bench also, if I can't get this to collapse fully. Yeah, let me take that over. We'll do both of these when this thing's chucked up into a vise. All right, let's uh, 
try it again. So we're gonna put the bowl for the pressure relief bowl in first, then the spring. And then we already have our spring ready to go in the uh, converter limit. And I'll just take our little driver. Let me see if I can actually do this in a way that you can see what the hell's going on. Just compress it down. And then once you have it started, you gotta be quick. Like I was too slow, so, cause the spring's gonna wanna, it's gonna wanna, um, you know, slide past your little retainer. Okay, it's a little off center. I need to adjust it further, I will. Okay, last is gonna be the uh, pressure relief. A lot of spring tension. And frankly, if you don't want to take this, um, you know, take this out, you don't, you don't really have to. really up to you. Hey, okay, just get it kind of centered. It should be fine, I'll straighten it out. It's back on the other bench. All right, let's go back to that other bench. All right, so the pump cover is assembled, at least all the valving's in. Um, just wanna double check. Make sure all your retainers are below flush. Again, just Check your boost valve, make sure it's fully seated. And then just make sure that to the extent you can, you got your springs centered up. I gotta still do this one. So on a real rebuild, regardless of the condition of the working surface, I mean, this is actually in really good shape. Most of these have, you know, um, extensive scoring and you can see deep ridges and grooves cut in it. But yeah, this one's kind of unusual, but you would still reface this. You wouldn't reuse it as is. So you would resurface the pump cover and then the pump body. What you would do is take that along with your rotor and your slide to your machinist. They would resurface uh, the face of the pump body and then they would cut the pocket to a depth needed to achieve the clearance that you need to achieve. So in other words, um, the clearance between the top of the slide and the rotor relative to the top of the face here on the pump body. The slide needs to see between uh, 
one and two thousandths clearance, and the rotor needs to see between one and one and a half thou clearance. So I'll put a straight edge on here when we get to this um, in a few seconds or a few minutes. But uh, first, we'll just finish up with the pump cover stator. All right, get your thrust washer here. It's two tabs. This is not selective. So uh, GM did not actually leave you with anything selective to adjust for end play. End play is more or less fixed at the factory. However, the aftermarket does have a solution. If you want to tighten up the end play, uh, it's something I recommend. It takes some of the slop out of the whole, you know, rotating assembly. And uh, there's shims that you can put over top here that will allow you to tighten it up. Uh, you would replace your bushings, so your rear stator bushing and a front bushing. You know, just get a complete bushing kit. You obviously replace your interlock sealing rings for the 3.5 and R drum um, with new ones. But like I said, this is just more or less to show you the procedure so you can get a good sense of what rebuilding a 6L80E or 90E entails. And, you know, while we're doing the pump, just to, before I forget, whatever you do, do not mix a stator pump cover from a 6L80E with a, uh, you know, pump body slash bell housing for a 6L90. Uh, the boost circuitry, boost hydraulic circuitry is different between the two, and you will have all kind of drivability problems, and the transmission will burn up in very short order. All right. Um... Other than that, as far as, you know, what to look for in the stator assembly, you know, stator pump cover or stator support, whatever you want to call it, just check your splines, make sure that they're not excessively worn out. Um, you know, very, very minor wear is fine, but anything beyond that, I'd replace it. Uh, and these bolts here, you do not have to remove them unless you're having to replace the stator and you just press it out once you get them out. Um, check the splines here too. Again, same deal, you want to make sure that they're not worn. Um, check inside. You want to make sure that there's no uh, grooves cut into the inner bore of the sealing surface inside the stator. And, um, you know, same with the journals. You want to make sure that these surfaces are nice and smooth, no issues, no scoring, no sort of heat damage, that kind of thing. Other than that, when you do a 6L8090, you are completely overhauling your pump assembly. Uh, machine work is done, you're improving the, you know, valving, the hydraulics, um, giving it a better boost valve and, and pressure regulator valve. Uh, if, <clears throat> you know, if it's deemed that during teardown inspection you see evidence that the PR valve bore is worn, um, you can either fix that or just simply replace the whole entire assembly um, with a brand new OEM GM one. So they're not cheap, obviously. I mean, you know, none of these parts really are if you're buying OEM, but that's what I would recommend you do. All right. Gonna slide those bolts out of the way for a little bit, and then we'll, we'll assemble this. But first, I want to check uh, clearance, because I am curious to see what kind of clearance I have between... Um, you know, slide and rotor. So when you check clearance, just put the uh, slide in by itself. Don't put the support or the support O-ring on. And then same with the rotor. Don't put the rotor guide or anything like that on there. Just drop it in. And then just grab a straight edge and some feeler gauges. So I'll use my usual for all these pump checks. Um, one and a half thou up to four thou. So I'm gonna start with the 2000s feeler gauge and see where that takes me. So like any other you know, pump you're gonna check in this manner, you just wanna go multiple different points, you know, this way and then this way so that you get 
you know, a good kind of comprehensive uh, check of everywhere that, um, you know, everywhere that you, you, know, you can within reason so that you can be confident that your measurements are accurate. Okay, and then come in at a shallow angle. So two thou is wanting to slide under, but only about halfway until it stops, or where if I push it on it any harder, it's gonna move the straight edge. Okay, so now we'll check both the uh, slide and the rotor. Okay, so rotor's giving me a little bit more than two thou here, but it's not there. So one to two thou on the slide, one and one and a half thou on the rotor. So if I'm getting, um, if I'm able to slide this, this two thou straight, or excuse me, this two thou feeler gauge under the rotor um, without moving it, then I know I'm out of spec, at least at that location. Okay, this is real borderline. My guess is that it's right at, oops, right at one and a half thou. We'll check it in a second with that one and a half thou gauge. The slide so far checks out. Now, how critical are these clearances in reality? Um, I'll be honest, I can't speak for the six LEDs or 90s or at least to me, they're too new. I haven't done enough of them to, you know, be able to say, yeah, if you know, you're at X clearance above spec, it's still okay. I mean, um, I wouldn't be comfortable doing that. But I know a 4L60 and 700 R scores. I'm clumsy today. 4L60s and 700 R fours. You can get away with up to about 4,000 clearance before it becomes a real problem. Uh, and that's with a, you know, daily driver, um, non-intense application, you know, low, moderate RPMs, not a lot of power. Okay. All right, so that's kind of the idea. Um, like I said I'd run the one and a half thou feeler gauge. So let's see what happens when I do that. Okay, slide, it's okay there. Uh, rotors, I mean, that's going under no problem with the rotor least in that location. Let's see here. So again, we're out, at least in the uh, spots that I marked. So that'll just be a reminder that I need to have this machine, which I would normally do anyway, so. All right, enough of that. Now, if you wanted to make sure, if you wanted to rerun your existing rotor and your existing slide, I'd recommend that you mic them to make absolutely sure that they're not unevenly worn, okay? So I just use like a zero to one inch micrometer that's capable of a resolution out to one ten thousandth of an inch. Now, if you have a situation where, you know, you don't have access to machining or, you know, you just, you have good working surfaces as far as no scoring, but, um, you can't have the pump worked over on a mill or whatever. You can consult the ATS uh, manual if you haven't already 
and look for the different thicknesses that are available for the rotor and the slide. And um, you can purchase uh, whatever rotor and slide combo of the thickness that you need to get within uh, what the factory requires clearance wise. I'm going to assemble this pretty much the same way I would assemble any other pump uh, you know, of this nature or of a, just a regular gear rater style or whatever. Um, you would replace this bushing and you'd obviously replace the front seal. Uh, to get the front seal out, you can either come in behind here with like a, a real thin punch or a screwdriver. Or you can also come in behind with a slide hammer and a special seal puller that hooks on the underside of the seal and it'll wrap it out. Okay, just note that you have a snap ring here. So <laughs> make sure you take that out before you, you know, start uh, pounding away at it or whatever. Okay, for the slide, you're going to have your support o-ring and then your your support itself. These are Teflon, unlike the 4L60 700R4s, those are powdered metal. And in case you were wondering, none of the parts in this pump interchange with the 4L60E 700R4. Uh, the dimensions are different. Uh, these are larger, you know, in diameter. Um, even, you know, these little things. Uh, the little slide spring and I guess pivot, you know, Teflon uh, slide pivot spring. That's what you want to call it. I mean, I know there's a correct technical term for it. I don't know what it is. But either way, uh, even those are different. They're slightly shorter than their 700R4 4L60E counterparts. And I say slightly, I mean like slightly but noticeably. Like you cannot substitute, or at least I wouldn't. And obviously these would come in the kit new. Then your pivot pin. And in the uh, 4L60s and 700s, that spring is separate. This is more integral. So it's just like an assembly. And it just goes in there. All right, so take like a big screwdriver. You're gonna install this pretty much in the exact same way as you would like a 4L60. Kind of collapse it in toward you as you, you know, force the spring down with your thumb and then stick it in there. Um, if you are on some kind of extreme budget and you absolutely need to reuse your pump vanes, Again, not recommended, but, you know, let's just say that was the case and, you know, is what it is. Uh, you want to make sure that you run the veins such that the, uh, you know, the, the side of the veins that were in use facing the slide, they go back in that way. Okay, so here's an example of what I'm talking about. So you see how you have wear here and wear here? That tells you that this faced away from the slide, whereas on this side, it's you know, evenly worn and shiny through the entire length that faced to the slide. So that's kind of how you want to, you know, put it back in and then you have your rotor guide. And that just helps it so it just wears um, less on the part that's already been kind of wear bonded to the slide versus, you know, introducing more and or more aggressive wear. But like I said, I never reuse these. Um, you know, you can buy them for like five, six bucks at a hard part supplier, just the veins. And if you're overhauling the entire pump assembly, which again is what you want to do, they would be in the broader kit that you buy for your pump. And in, in many cases, the machinist will actually do the pre-assembly for you, at least, you know, this portion. Um, because they have to check clearances anyway, so it's possible they may just assemble it for you. 
But if not, this is how you go about it. Like I said, uh, this core is in unusually good shape. It seems like it has low miles on it. Uh, the only thing wrong with it, and um, why it became a core, right, and why it's not still in the vehicle driving around, is the 3.5R drum, like all of them, uh, started leaking at the base at the welds where they, you know, they were starting to fail and apply fluid starts hemorrhaging into the case when it should be going to that 3.5R clutch piston. And you know, one thing leads to another and things start slipping like crazy. And that's the end of that. All right, a pump O-ring. Goes around here. But I'll put that on later. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna mate the two halves and then we got our pump bolts. So, There are 13 of these and there is a tightening sequence, much like the valve body that you have to adhere to. So we'll go through that once we have the two halves aligned. Hey, real easy way to know exactly how the cover should go oriented relative to the body is look for this area right here. You got three bolts in sort of a triangle configuration. You're gonna see the same three bolts here on the pump cover. And if you're looking at it like this, you're immediately to the uh, three o'clock position, I guess, relative to the 12 o'clock position represented by your clutch feed ports and your filter seal. Just get your bolts started. A lot of bolts and they don't take a lot of torque so it's GM or Ison this is a I think a joint design effort between GM and uh, Japanese transmission manufacturer Ison or Ison I'm probably butchering the pronunciation it's spelled A-I-A-S-N and um, possibly ZF2 I mean these all these 6L 8L and 10L series transmissions from GM and the equivalent Ford units are all largely based on the ZF6 HP26. Uh, I mean, that's kind of the hereditary design lineage um, of these units. They're not directly related, really, in any way, shape, or form to um, the 4L60s and 4L80Es. You know, that, that quote unquote bloodline stopped once the 60s and the 80s went out of production in you know, the late 2010s or 2013 or whenever it was. So in the event you don't have anything to align this, I mean, you can use a very large hose clamp or the special tools they make. Uh, you can use the case. So just cinch a couple bolts down. You know, visually line up the two halves as best as you possibly can. And then just tighten down, say four bolts. You know, I'm just going, you know, kind of a 3, 6, 9, 12 position here. Not really paying attention to the actual order. Um, but yeah, just more or less get them as, get this thing as lined up as you can and then use the case to align everything else. Or to, I should say, to check your, your alignment. It's going to probably take you a couple of iterations to do it. You should be able to align the pump uh, cover and body using only the case.
You just double check. All the way around. You know, look literally the entire diameter. Make sure that everything is seated. That that bell housing is firmly and flush against the case. If you want, you can go so far as to stick a few bolts, just to be sure. And for 15 millimeter, pump the case. As long as you don't feel anything unusual, then you've pretty much successfully aligned the two pump halves. You know, everything has to be 100% flush all the way around. The two mating surfaces have to be, um, you know, perfect with each other. No gaps and nothing weird going on. Okay. It's kind of heavy, so I'm not gonna spin it all the way around, but you get the point. So that's pump alignment without any special tools. So now we'll take this thing back to the bench and torque all the bolts to spec in the order as the uh, manual calls for. Alright, so I have all of the bolts marked with the Sharpie in the sequence that we need to tighten them in. So they all get 97 inch pounds. There's 13 of them. So we start up here and then kind of just work our way around per the order that you see here on uh, pump cover. So all 8 millimeter. And I probably should have run the rest of these down while I'm at it. So when you're running them down just to get them like, you know, on, doesn't matter what, you know, what order you do it in. Just as long as you don't tighten them up too much to, to the point where you're out of sequence. Okay, number one, and we got number two, and then number three, and then so forth. Hey, new set of gloves. It's number 
one. Number two. Out. Okay, that's all of them. So pump is assembled and more or less ready to be installed back onto the case when the time comes. If you have a checking tool, just to confirm that everything is okay with, you know, the assembly and the internals and everything's gonna kinda work as uh, intended, you can just check it real quick. Just make sure that that rotor and slide spin nice and easy, that there's nothing binding, nothing caught up. You, know, you don't hear or feel anything unusual. So this is fine. All right, pump's done. Okay, we'll start with the 3.5 in reverse drum. Assemble that, put that all together. Uh, one thing I'll make mention, just, you know, it's kind of a best practice or a piece of advice for those that are building a transmission that they're not familiar with, or maybe it's a unit that they haven't worked in in quite a long time is that when you have either uh, anywhere in the transmission that takes very similar size lip seals or O-rings or what have you, uh, it can be confusing. Um, you know, there's a possibility you might put the uh, wrong lip seals or wrong sealing rings in the incorrect locations if they're really similar and at a glance they look identical. So case in point is the balance piston for the 3.5R. Um, this O-ring here, or sealing ring, goes on the top. This one here, goes on the bottom, but at a glance, they look nearly identical in size. So, um, best practice is to just keep these sealing rings or lip seals on their respective pistons or drums or whatever through the cleaning process so that you only take them off when you're ready to install the new ones and you can compare directly by eye which one is which and, you know, where each one goes. So this one here is going to go on the top. This is your your front sealing ring or lip seal and your middle is obvious. And then like with any lip seal you want to make sure it's in the groove all the way properly. And then your bottom. Now if you mix and match them, you know if you get the top one on the bottom or you try to put the top one in the bottom groove, um, you will notice that it doesn't fit quite right. So it, in that respect, it'll give you kind of a, a check so that you know to reset and you know correct the uh, mistake. This is your apply piston and this is your balance piston. And then all these Belleville style return springs, uh, they all go with the teeth or the tabs facing up except for the 2.6 piston that goes face down. Okay, so for the drum, you're also going to have three lip seals. So this big one will go here, right at the base. There's a groove there for it. So you just want to get it in the groove. Make sure it's in all the way around and make sure it's not twisted. Okay, the next O-ring or ceiling ring is going to be the thinner of the two. Okay, notice that uh, one of my left hands thicker. That's going to be the top ceiling ring. 
So there's two grooves down here at the very base of the stator inside the drum. This little lip seal is going to go in the bottom groove. The top groove is for the snap ring for the whole 3-5R apply complex. Okay, you want to make sure it's in the correct groove. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, and then your last lip seal is going to go right here in this middle groove. Okay, you just want to be careful sliding it over the splines. Kentmore does make some special tools like lip seal protector tools. You can acquire them if you want. They're not really necessary. You know, you just want to use care when installing these things, that's all. Unless I got, got this one twisted up a little bit, so I'm going to pull it out and reset. Okay, so there's the three lip seals installed. So you got two snap rings in this drum. The bigger one's gonna be for the three five in reverse apply and balance piston, and the smaller one's gonna be for the one, two, three, four apply and balance piston. So we're gonna put this one in first. We'll lube everything up, drum and lip seals. Just take care not to pop any of them out when you're going over it with the brush or whatever you're using. And use plenty of lube. So all of the snap rings have to be installed on a shop press. Um, I mean, I guess you can try using a, a really big foot press, but um, it is an absolute pain and you're not going to be able to get all of them on using just a foot press. You really need to use a shop press with either a purpose-built uh, clutch spring compressor tool or an adjustable one like I have and you'll see shortly. And you've seen it in other videos uh, you know, if you've watched any of them. I use it on multiple different you know transmissions for you know foreign domestic your make models etc. So the same way you apply pistons, you know, lube them up as thoroughly as you can, inner and outer diameters, you know, anywhere there's a sealing surface has to be lubed. And again, that's just, you know, generally true of any transmission, not just this one. Okay. Incidentally, if the drum doesn't ring like that when you, you know, when you hit it with something, if it sounds more muted, then that would tell me that there's a crack somewhere in the structure. Okay, so the applied piston goes in first. Just carefully lower it in. And then you should be able to press it right down into the pocket. Now again, with new lip seals, it'll be a little bit harder to do, but I mean, not terribly so. Okay, again, tabs facing up. And then 
here is our balance piston. As you can see, you got the tab wear marks in the piston itself. Um, just check this piston over. If it's cracked or shows any sign of defect or you know, you're concerned about anything, you know, when in doubt, simply replace it. Otherwise, just lower it in carefully. Well, <laughs> a little more carefully than that. I mean, I just happen to avoid hitting any of the uh, part of the journal. And then just press it on in. Okay, it'll go in about part way so that the uh, surface here, the top, is you know just above the apply surface on the apply piston. And then your snap rim. Okay, so I'm just going to get it where it needs to go. It's just easier to do it on the bench versus, you know, trying to do it on the press. Okay, so speaking of that, let's go over there so that we can install the snap ring. Okay, we got the drum and the press, uh, you know, balanced piston and Belleville plate fully compressed as much as we can get it such that the uh, snap ring groove is exposed. Now, this thing's going to want to fight you. It's probably going to fight me. You want to have like a hammer and a flat blade screwdriver handy so that you can seat it all the way around. A lot of times um, it won't seat 100% on the press, so you just got to persuade it in the rest of the way. This particular tool is uh, Kentmore DT47867. It'll meet all your um, clutch spring compressor needs in this transmission, except for the 2.6 Belleville plate. Uh, that's that you know uh, compresses on the perimeter. So we'll show you a way how you can get that in without the special tool that Kentmore uh, or the manuals have you acquire, uh, you know, to to fully install that you know that uh, apply piston and return spring setup. So right here on the left side, it is just above the snap ring groove. So what it'll do is just take a flat blade screwdriver, just tap on it, do the same to the right side, kind of pry inward all the way around. Like I said, this is a real tight fit. And this is why you want a shop press. Um, this would be damn near impossible to do on a traditional foot press. And many of these assemblies are just a little bit too big for one of those vice mounted units. All right, it appears to be in. We're going to go ahead and uh, release the press, and if it pops out, then, you know, we got to go at it again. But if not, we'll be good. Okay, just check it all the way around. And like I said, you want to go at it with a screwdriver and a hammer just to make doubly sure it's truly in there. Last thing you need is to have this thing pop out after transmission's back installed and on the road. And I'll air check this thing multiple times, so if it is gonna pop out, it'll pop out when it's on the bench and we can fix it then. All right, now we'll go ahead and deal with the one, two, three, four piston. It'll lube everything up. As I mentioned in the overview, you never want to reuse factory piston. 
it likes to crack and break. Uh, earlier units like this one were more prone to that than the later ones. They redesigned this piston to help you know mitigate that you know that problem. But uh, you know there was still there was still more failures than you would want to see. So the risk of reusing this and having it crack on you is just too great not to purchase the, uh, the Sonics piston. Okay, so side will face down and it seals against this top ceiling ring or uh, lip seal there on the stator. Okay, it'll normally just seat right in position or right in place I should say. And then your little Belleville return spring and then your balance piston. So the balance piston is going to go such that these three tabs, the side with those three tabs face up, face you. Okay, back to the press. Hey, this snap ring is not as finicky as the other one. So that should be no problem. Okay, you just want to expose the groove here below the splines. What did I say? It was not as finicky. That's nah, more user error. Uh, plier selection. These pliers are just ever so slightly too small. Before we begin installing our clutch packs, I want to make a mention of something critically important. So the 6L80s, there's going to be two lugs in here. This one here, and this one here directly across from it. These lugs, you'll notice, are uninterrupted. So this is going to be for the 1, 2, 3, 4 clutch. You'll notice the snap ring groove for that clutch and every other lug except this one. When you install your snap ring, the ends have to bracket this uninterrupted lug. Okay, if it, they uh, interfere with it or overlap it, then the snap ring's probably gonna pop out. For the 3.5 and R clutch, same deal. You got your snap ring groove all the way around until you get to this lug, and then you have no uh, cutout there. So make absolutely sure that your ends of your snap ring you know, on either side of that inter uninterrupted lug for each of these respective clutch packs. Okay, one, two, three, four. So you're gonna have a wage plate, and then you're gonna have five flat steels and five frictions and a pressure plate. So 
the snap rings for all of the front clutch packs, that's the 1, 2, 3, 4, the 3, 5, R, and the 4, 5, 6, they're all selective. And you can determine which specific snap ring that you have based on the little, um, the little uh, color reference mark placed on the snap ring. Now, there's one snap ring in each of these clutch packs, uh, you know, selective wise, that's not marked but uh, the other three are marked. I'll go ahead and flash a quick chart showing the different thicknesses that are available. But the bottom line is you wanna make sure that you have maybe a couple of different selective snap rings for each of these clutch packs on hand in the event you're not meeting your clearance requirements. And you wanna make absolutely sure that you are meeting those requirements because in the 6L80, 6L90, and any clutch-to-clutch -clutch transmission, uh, clutch-to-clutch -clutch meaning that there's no bands in the transmission, um, all your gear changes and you know uh, gear reductions are achieved via just simply applying and release of various combinations of clutch packs. Uh, if you are out of spec on anything, um, you know, even by as little as a few thou. Uh, you could have drivability issues, you know, slight little bind-ups or tie-ups, you know, or other, you know, um, issues where, you know, clutch is either dragging or applying slightly out of schedule because the clearance is either too loose or too tight. All right, so we'll stack everything up. Last thing I'll point out with respect to the intermediate, or excuse me, the uh, one, two, three, four clutch is these tabs here, starting with the uh, wave plate, you want to align them so that they kind of, you know, bracket the uninterrupted lug, and you have to make absolutely sure that all of your steels are all, you know, splined into the same sets of lugs so that they line up. Otherwise, you're never going to get your uh, three five in reverse apply ring into the drum. There's your steels, and then we'll stack up the rest. So if your steels look like these do, they're perfectly fine to reuse. If they're all scorched and burnt, blued and whatnot, then you'll want to replace with a new steel module or a new set of steels for the clutch that looks like that. And you'll see what I mean when we get to the 3.5 in reverse clutch pack. And you know, a little bit of like light scoring like that, you can deal with that with like a wafer pad, just do some prep work on the steels. Okay, you're going to have uh, wear marks here on the pressure plate, just align those facing up, and then your snap ring. So with the snap ring, I will start it as you know close to the lug as I possibly can, try to pinch it, hold it down, and then you know just slide the other side in, and you'll be where you need to be. If you want to center it up, you can, I suppose. But either way, it should be fine. So as mentioned, clutch clearance for this is between 60 and 78 thou. So I'm going to just use some feeler gauges real quick to see where it's actually at. And I'll go on the high side first. So I'll do 25, 26, and 27 thousandths. So I'm able to slide it in, but you'll notice it's forcing the pressure plate down ever so slightly. Now because these frictions are used, they're you know probably worn out just a little bit, you know, maybe a couple thou, a few thou. I mean they look okay superficially or visually, but you never know. Um, new frictions and new steels, assuming you're using the correct pressure plate, or excuse me, the correct uh, snap ring, um, you know, you'll be within your within your clearance range that you need to be. And in preparation for assembly into the case, you can line up the, uh, you know, the teeth on the clutch discs if you want. Okay, 3.5 reverse clutch pack. Just go ahead and spline, spline in your, your apply ring. 
And here's what I mean by messed up steels. Okay, you would never ever reuse a steel module that looks like this. Okay, wave plate. Let's locate our uninterrupted lug. And then we'll, we'll do our steel friction, steel friction. So start with your flat steel. And you'll see like kind of a glazing on the side that faces the, uh, the apply ring. So you know, just maintain that arrangement. If you're reusing your steels, which for this clutch, you're never gonna reuse steels. It's always burnt, it's always stressed. Okay, your snap ring. So same deal, start it as close to that lug as you can. And it's gonna overlap a little bit. Little OCD there. Just make sure you got clearance. So, again, we're going to go at the high end. We'll do 22, 23, and 24 thousandths. There's a lot of glare. I'm sorry about that. So, this will give us 69 thou. Okay, so. 69 thou is not fitting, so let's go with the low end, 48 thou. So I'll do 24 and 25, that's close enough. Okay, it's sliding in. Fitting comfortably all the way around, so we know that we are within the range that we need to be. And you can check both of these clutches on a dial indicator, you know, using an air checking tool. Uh, I may do that uh, just to show you for demonstration. But this drum is done. So as I mentioned in the overview, you're going to want to replace this roller bearing. There is a sealing surface here, or lip seal. Okay, that can form just like any other consumable. And then right here is where you will have you're cracking so I mean, you can visually see these welds are horrible um, it's only a matter of time literally from the moment it leaves the factory floor when this drum you know starts to bleed uh, apply fluid out of this you know somewhere along this perimeter here so um, you can do this if you want you know it's up to you I'll just show you just take a little bit of transmission fluid kind of smear it just a thin coat is all you need. Just smear it around the perimeter like this. And then install your air check tool and introduce air into the 3-5R clutch. And you'll see little bubbles or, you know, uh, areas where air is rushing out of that location and, you know, moving the fluid. I mean, it's obvious. All right, so here's a checking tool I use for uh, the three five and R drums, uh, it's O-ringed, works very well. So I want to lube up the bore, and then the tool itself, just to make sure there's no issues. And then want to flip it over. And this one takes like a 916 bolt and it just locks it in place so that the tool or the drum don't like decouple from each other when you're putting air into the clutch circuits. Hey, so the first thing I'll show you is the you know where the leaks are happening on the drum and you know how you can spot them. So I'm gonna put air into the 35R feed port here and you'll kind of see as we rotate the drum where the bubbles and air is being forced up, you know, through these welds.
The drum may move around a little bit on the bench. Okay. All right, see right here? It's readily obvious that the uh, welds there are no longer holding, so they're no good. Apply fluid is essentially hemorrhaging at this location, and you know, as it progresses, it'll get to the point where you know, that clutch will completely burn and you will no longer have any movement in reverse. And of course, uh, third and fifth gear will also be missing. All right, so we'll apply uh, to do the air check. So what we're looking for is nice firm apply such that when you, um, you have air going into the circuit and it's energized, when you try to move your frictions like this, okay, you should not be able to move them. If you can, that means that uh, you know one or more of those uh, ceiling rings or lip seals got cut during installation. All right, and it's trash day, so sorry about the noise in the background. Okay, full energized. Release. One, two, three, four. Okay, release. So, because of the way the uh, the Belleville springs are oriented, and you know the overall design of you know, these clutch apply, uh, you know, pistons and, and whatnot, they're not going to apply, you know, real distinct like a traditional clutch pack. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, you have that firm whoop, and then release, they apply almost gradually, at least that's how it appears. I mean, it's very similar to how your uh, Ford clutch applies in a Ford or a Dodge transmission. You know, they use the, the Belleville plates, and that's how they apply. All right. Aside from the fact that this drum is leaking, that apply circuit for both the 35R and the 1334 check good. And that means that the uh, all of the ceiling rings were installed correctly, and none of them got cut or, you know, otherwise damaged on the way in. Okay, 3.5R drum is done. Okay, now we'll go ahead and start working on the 4.5.6 clutch drum and input planet slash sun gear. Let's get everything into the view. Okay, so the 4.5.6 clutch can also see some damage, some heat. There's six friction, six steels. Uh, clearance in this clutch pack needs to be between 50 and 74 thousandths. If it's not, if it's tight, then you'll have ever so slight bindings or bind ups, I should say, um, on the two, three shift. And that's primarily because the um, uh, clutch pressure solenoid is actually fired during the uh, two, three apply to prepare for the uh, four, five, six clutch apply. So, in essence, um, with that energy, that circuit energized, if the clearance in this pack is too tight, it will actually partially apply, and it'll feel like a slight bind up. Sometimes it'll happen just on you know uh, you know your first part of the drive cycle. In other words, you know you literally shift into um, third gear for the first time. Uh, it can happen more frequently than that. It can happen when it's hot or only when it's cold. It really depends on, you know, uh, how out of spec this clutch is and in what direction, you know, whether it's, you know, out of spec too tight or if there's out of spec and it's too loose, you know, you'll have similar issues or you'll have slipping in, um, you know, or 
in you know fourth, fifth, or sixth gear. All right, so we're gonna install the ply in the balance piston first. So balance piston goes into the drum just like this, with the the teeth on the Belleville plate facing up, you know, facing you. And then you stick your balance piston right over top. You compress the spring, and then you install a little snap ring. And it goes right there, and that's that. So this is the only clutch that I can actually install uh, the apply piston using the foot press. All the other ones I gotta use the regular shock press. All right, we'll take you over to the foot press and we'll go ahead and install everything. Yeah, just lube everything up real thorough like any other ceiling surface and any other drum or piston. Okay, both sides of the piston, inside and out. And this will just drop right in. So a little bit of downward pressure is all you need. Just, you know, try to get it centered. And that's all you need to do. Okay, same with the balance piston, lube it up. You would normally replace these pistons on a proper overhaul. I would never recommend you reuse them. Um, when I pulled this transmission apart, it actually looked really good. I mean, as you see, all the clutches and all the steels other than the 3.5R are in usable shape. And, you know, other than the 3.5 in reverse clutch, you know, the rest of the trans would have worked just fine. You know, if only it was as simple as that, right? So while I can use the foot press, I am putting essentially all of my weight on the foot press to get it to compress. And as I mentioned before, I mean, you can also, and that's one of the hazards of using gloves, they like they get caught up. You can also replace the Belleville plates. You know, it's, it's recommended, especially on a really high mileage unit. And I'm sorry if I'm being redundant and repeating myself. I may have mentioned this in the overview, but you know, it's a good idea. They do tend to crack and break. Um, in general, I'm not saying that's a real problem with this particular transmission, you know, the 6L80s, 6L90s, but in general, they do get worn out and can crack. All right, let's go back to the bench and finish everything up. Okay, unlike the uh, 3.5R drum, there's no particular, you know, um, arrangement you need to keep in mind with respect to your steels. Uh, there's no unsplined, or excuse me, ungrooved spline or ungrooved lug that you need to worry about. You just, you know, put them in as you need to, and that's that. Uh, these steels are in okay shape, but if we were rebuilding this unit for real, I would put a, uh, a new set of steels in here. Like I said, this clutch will also see some heat, especially if temps are allowed to climb north of, you know, 215, 220 on a regular basis. So you want to do what you can to keep uh, trans temperatures down. Uh, ideally, you want to be south of 215, 220 at all times. You really don't want to be, you know, much higher than that. Uh, when you run a large aftermarket trans cooler and or deep pan, and most transmissions, they'll run at around 175 degrees, and that's perfect. So the apply plate or pressure plate is stepped, so just make sure that the step side faces up. And then install your snap ring. Okay, I mean, by feel, this feels correct. But, you know, we want to double check. So we're looking for a max of 74 thousandths. 
So I will do three feeler gauges. We'll do 23, 24, and 25 thou and see how well that fits underneath the pressure plate between it and the top friction. Okay, it fits, but it's really tight. Like I'm having to force the rest of the clutch pack down to keep it in there. Okay, so let's do 50. And we sh this should fit right in there without any issue whatsoever. I'll actually do 51. So 25 and 26 thou, and that fits no problem. No problem at all. So technically speaking, this clutch pack is perfectly fine the way we're setting it up. Uh, this snap ring is also selective, and I'll annotate the video with the different thicknesses that are available from the factory. All right, so now we can go ahead and attend to our front planet or our input planet in sun gear. First, you're gonna have a bearing. Okay, uh, the inner side of the bearing faces down on the drum. Then for your planet, whatever you do, do not install this planet backwards. Okay, this is actually the bottom. So this side here takes, takes the four tab thrust washer and that side faces down. And as you can see, the thrust washer is technically broken. So you'd replace this, but you know, we're not gonna bother. Um, if you install it such that this side, which faces up, instead faces down, you will not be able to engage the splines in the 3-5R drum, okay? So that's how it goes. And then the drum, you know, kind of goes down and splines over in on top of it. So you don't want to make that mistake because if you do, you'll have no movement whatsoever. All right, get the planet in the frame so that you can see what's going on. And then just lower it and let it mesh. Okay, sun gear is orientation agnostic. You can put it in whichever way, it does not matter. And that concludes the uh, four, five, six clutch and front planet buildup. You would obviously replace your ceiling rings there on the input shaft. Now you need a special sizing tool, though you can use like a hose clamp. And what I always do is if you, you know, buy a, uh, paper and rubber kits, I believe from either Transstar or TransTech, uh, they'll come with those like, you know, little um, circular lip seal tools. Uh, you can use, uh, you can cut one of them, you know, kind of in strips and use that to protect the uh, ceiling rings um, while you tighten up the hose clamp so that the hose clamp doesn't pinch the ceiling rings, you know, when you're sizing the, uh, you know, when you're sizing them. All right, now we'll do the, uh, Three hubs. Okay, you're gonna have a set of bearings that go to these hubs. So I'll show you the arrangement. I mean, you're gonna install, you know, each of these individually when you go back with it um, to assemble the case. So. Here is your 456 clutch hub. It's got a fixed in place uh, bearing here. And then this bearing serves as the race for this bearing, which this bearing goes to your 1234. I'm grabbing the 35R, goes to your 1234 like this. So it's up to you how you want to seat this. I mean, it really doesn't matter. You can put it on the one, two, three, four. You can put it on this one, but 
I'm actually going to stick it on the other one for now. Okay, in here you have your damper. So this is the bottom side of the damper. This is the top side of the damper. All right, don't install this backwards. This literally just is in place to, to serve as a uh, vibration dampener for the entire rotating assembly. So put that there. Then you have your, your cover plate. And then you have a waved snap ring. So it's waved like this on purpose. Install it. And that's that for most of that. And then you have your little bearing that goes on the other side here on the little pilot journal. And the tabs here are going to face you. They're going to face up, face you. Just like that. Very simple. Okay, so you have this, your one, two, three, four hub. And then you have your four, five, six hub. And you're going to mate just like that. And nicely, this is your three, five in reverse hub. Note the bushing, particularly the depth of the bushing. You want to make sure you, you either record that, write it down, take a picture because this top hat bearing is going to go in such a manner that the top hat will sit like, sit like so. You don't want to have the top hat um, being interfered with by the bushing. Okay, pretty simple. Probably could have explained that a lot more concisely. So there's all your hubs. Okay, I'm going to shift the camera a little bit leftward down the bench so that we can tackle the center support, the 2-6 uh, clutch, and the low reverse clutch.